call back to order this meeting of the Sac City Unified Education Board of Education. We're going to go ahead right now and have our broadcast statement read by our student board member. Uh, this meeting of the Sacramento City School Board is being recorded in its entirety and will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse. Today's meeting will air Sunday, August 20th at 9.30 p.m., Monday, August 21st at 6 p.m., and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. We welcome members of the audience to address the board. Please fill out a speaker form located in the back of the community room and give them to our communications representative prior to the conclusion of the item's presentation. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Please limit comments during public comment to items that are not on the agenda. If you do comment on an item that is on the agenda, we will ask that you please defer your comments until your item comes up on the agenda. Please also turn off your cell phones or place them on silent or vibrate. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wen. We're going to go ahead and have the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led this evening by the 2017 Summer of Service Ambassadors, representing Sac City Unified School District's high schools. If we can please have you come towards the front of the podium. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I can have you remain up towards the front of the room with the podium. We're going to go ahead and present you with a certificate by our second vice president, Daryl Wu. We want to thank you for your active engagement in our summer programming. And board president or board vice president Daryl Wu had an opportunity to see you in your summer culmination ceremonies. So thank you again for being a part of our wonderful suite of summer programming. And it was, a, it was a very wonderful event at Golden One Center. I think that was a fantastic event. And I think it was actually, if you never, had never been to the Golden One Center, that's just a fantastic um, uh, uh, opportunity for you to see our newest arena. So uh, I have a statement someplace, and it's coming up on my iPhone, on my cell phone, because I think or my assistant forgot to bring it. So if you uh, if you'll bear with me, um, I'm going to stall a little bit while she grabs the statement because apparently it's not coming up on my phone. Well, while she grabs the statement, would I um, can I ask our students to just share for the next thirty seconds uh, a bit about the programs that you participated in this summer? Choose a representative. Go ahead. Hello. I was kind of peer pressured by my after school <laughs> my after school project manager, Mr. Jenkins, to apply for to be a, a summer ambassador. And I made the decision I finalized the decision by um making sure that every freshman, incoming freshman that comes to my school and onto my site feels welcome. And you know, like they have a friend already in the in the school system. So that's, that's pretty much why I did it, because I came there and I was the only person from my middle school, a health professions high school, and I was like, you know what, this is kind of lame, but at the orientation, everyone, um, I mean like everyone just like welcomed me, they made sure I had a good time, they made sure I felt, you know, safe and welcome, and I wanted to just continue that and make it, um, can make it a tradition. So I hope I inspire someone who will do it the next year, or I can just do it again. Thank you so much for okay. stepping up and leading among your peers. So at this time, our board vice president, Daryl Wu, will read the statement. Thank you. And thank you for bearing with me. 
The Summer Matters Ambassadors Program provides leadership opportunities to high school age youth focusing on job skills development and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Ambassadors go through a rigorous application and selection process, even if somebody dragged you in to make you fill out the application. <laughs> Once selected, each ambassador collects, completes 15 hours of professional development. This year, there are 44 ambassadors who represent six different high schools dedicating their service to 16 different Summer Matters elementary and secondary school sites. Each student committed to over 140 hours of service to their school district and community. As a group, the Summer Matters ambassadors accrued 6,336 hours of service. So the Board of Education is proud to recognize our Summer Matters ambassadors as our stellar students. Thank you. Wonderful. Please join me in applauding our Summer Ambassadors. So I'm going to go take a picture with them. I just wanted to say, it was, this is my attempt at a selfie with Superintendent <laughs> Aguilar, but I wanted to capture the, the number of students who were behind us getting ready to celebrate. Vice President Wu is going to make his way to the front so we can take a picture with you. Thank you. Thank you again to our Summer of Service Ambassadors. Hi, everybody. My name is Megan, and I was at Golden Empire Elementary throughout the Summer Matters program. And I thought it was amazing. I was horrified that the children would not like me because, you know, I'm just self-conscious and whatever. But the very first day, the kids ran up to me and they're like, oh, Miss Megan, do you want to go play? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I love this. <laughs> and at the very end my program manager walked up to me and she was and she said to me that she'd love for me to come visit and help tutor the kids throughout the school year Wonderful. and I am going to do that as much as I can and I'm going to keep doing this program because I love it so much the children are great and I appreciate the opportunity all of you guys gave me by having the summer matters program Thank you. And we hope that one day you might become a teacher and come back to the district. Oh, yeah. So item 5.0, announcement of action taken in closed session. None, Madam President. Item 6.0, agenda adoption. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Seeing none. We'll adopt the agenda. We're going to item 7.0, special presentation, the opening of schools for the 2017-18 school year by Dr. Iris Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Good evening, First Vice President Ryan, board members, Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Iris Taylor, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer. And I'm joined tonight by my colleagues from various departments, including the Enrollment Center, Human Resources, Curriculum and Instruction, Technology Services, Student Support Services, and Youth Development, and the Youth Development Department. We're here tonight to update you on the district's progress and preparedness for, op for the opening of schools for the 2017-18 school year.
I'd have that tech person. <laughs> We're having some technical difficulties. Here we go. So the updates we will, that you will hear tonight <clears throat> and the preparation that has been underway is designed to advance the goals I outlined on this slide. Those being college and career and life ready, life ready graduates, safe emotionally and healthily, healthy engaged students, family and community empowerment and operational excellence. In addition, under the leadership of Superintendent Aguilar, we are provoked by this equity access and social justice guiding principle to assess to what degree are the practices of our divisions, including the opening of schools, designed to serve students so that they are all given an equal opportunity to graduate with the greatest number of post-secondary choices from the widest array of options. We'll begin tonight's presentation with an update on the work of our, enro our enrollment and matriculation and orientation center. Thank you, good evening. My name is Kenneth McPeters. I'm the Director of Enrollment and Attendance. Uh, new in 2017, we've uh, established an online registration program. Uh, it, was, it went live April uh, 18th of 2017, and it allows the parents the uh, comfort of uh, enrolling uh, their students, at least doing the paperwork from the comfort of their own home, or uh, actually coming out to the enrollment center and using the kiosk format. Uh, and to date, we have had uh, 926 applicants do it online. Uh, we've applied regional centers at Rosemont and Burbank. They have been open all month uh, to help register students as well. And the enrollment center is also open on Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. to access the, uh, the public. The our matriculation orientation center has administered 550 kindergarten self-tests as well as uh, translating over 20 documents with 170 pages and helped the enrollment center register over 800 students. Uh, you can see some of the new uh, things that have been added into the enrollment center at this slide. And lastly, uh, combine the enrollment center and the mock center uh, to, to, uh, the date, to the date of August 8th, have enrolled over, excuse me, have had 5,602 parent contacts and have actually had uh, 20, uh, 2,901 registrations. Good evening, I'm Tiffany Smith-Simmons and I'm representing Human Resources this evening. We've been busy gearing up for the start of the school year and I would like to highlight some of those here for you. We have increased our number of new employee orientations, offering them every Tuesday. We have provided and supported annual trainings. We have also extended our recruitment efforts both locally and out of the area. Our recruitment efforts help to diversify our staff. We targeted classified employees and offered financial assistance for those entering the Teaching Pathway Program through a grant. We launched a program with Sac State offering an opportunity to earn a dual credential, multiple subjects and education specialists, and we recruited at historically black colleges and universities. Thank you. This slide highlights our gearing up by the numbers. We have filled nearly 200 certificated vacancies and completed over 3,000 transactions. On July 26, nearly 1,000 attended our classified recruitment fair, and we've processed over 800 fingerprints, all efforts to ensure that we are ready to go on the first day of school. Good evening. My name is Matt Turkey, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. And in terms of instructional materials, we're on track for ensuring that all schools have sufficient instructional materials for the start of the school year. The ELA ELD Adoption Committee met over the summer and will be soon moving into the piloting stage. And we are on track for the full K-12 ELA ELD Adoption for the 2018-19 school year. Also, during the summer, 81 middle school students enrolled in summer school math and 410 high school students enrolled in summer school math credit recovery. We have had many professional learning sessions over the summer focused on areas such as English learners, math, science, and social emotional learning. 
1,451 teachers and leaders have attended or are scheduled to attend professional learning sessions this summer. Good evening, my name is Elliot Lopez, Chief Information Officer. Technology Services has been hard at work preparing student and teacher devices for the new school year, rolling out upgrades and delivering the hundreds of new computers purchased recently. We are preparing instructional applications and resources like iReady and Khan Academy so that our students are able to log in when they arrive on their very first day. Last year, over 7,500 students logged into these applications each day. And we expect that number to grow as instructional technology becomes more available to our students in our classrooms. We're also working with the academic office to support the use of these new tools and resources by our teachers and our students. Last year, we trained over 1,100 teachers on the use of G Suite and other instructional technology tools. This year, we're happy to announce plans to roll out Google Classroom district-wide. We've received dozens of requests for this powerful tool from our schools, and this year we're gonna make it happen. While we are expanding the availability of instructional resources, we also need to ensure that there is a sound infrastructure in place to provide access to deliver this rich content. And to that end, we have continued to roll out additional network and wireless upgrades to improve network connectivity and to expand access at many schools. Over the summer, for example, 20 schools were identified and began receiving these upgrades. Good evening, my name is Victoria Flores and I serve as the Director of Student Support and Health Services. As you can see, we have been hard at work making sure our students are immunized and ready for school. We gave almost 3,000 vaccines last school year. We've been providing technical assistance to our school sites and our uh, department, um, district department, sorry, who uh, support our families in immunization compliance. We've been doing a lot of outreach to our families, really promoting best practices. Go see your primary care physician, have that well child check, and by the way, see what you're due for. And um, we've also been clearing students through the California Immunization Registry, which is ongoing. We cleared 200 students just yesterday. Um, but our biggest push is our IZ clinic. It just opened yesterday, and boy, we've been busy. Um, we're right next door in the enrollment center in room four, if you ever want to pop by. We've got seven clinics going uh, for August. We will be open the first two days of school, both in the morning and the evening, to really help support our families. If, they're, if they don't have their vaccines, they can come to our clinic, get an immunization, and get right back into school. We will also be open every um, Thursday from 3 to 6 p.m. Um, in conjunction with the Enrollment Center's late hours. And I'd like to just give a shout out to our partners. Charles A. Jones Skills Center, their LVN intern program that you all support, they're working right next door right now in our IZ clinic, so helping to support us in our capacity. And then we also partner with Sacramento Covered at our in, uh, in immunization clinic who helps enroll our families in health insurance, but most importantly, also helps them navigate the insurance that they have. Um, and then the Center for Oral Health sends us over a dental hygienist who provides a screening, fluoride treatment, and also navigation of dental services. So we're really proud of that partnership and, and so happy um, to be able to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening, Stacy Alt, Youth Development Director. So Youth Development just finished our seventh successful Summer Matters at SCUSD program. We served 3,331 students K-12. 2,293 of them were elementary students who participated in Summer Quest. We worked again this year with the academic office to develop theme-based learning. Um, both curriculum and assessments that incorporated math, ELA, and STEAM. And this, this year's summer theme for Summer Quest was superheroes. We also served 1,038 transitioning 7th, 8th, and 9th grade students in our Summer of Service program. And almost 100 students, 10th through 12th grade, got work-based experience and internships through 
both the student ambassador program, you met some summer ambassadors, as well as summer at City Hall. We are on track with agencies being ready to go, fully staffed for the first day of school. And we've been also working on developing our share of cost model for before and after school programs based on some feedback from the board. You'll hear more about this during the school year. We have uh, finally an exciting emerging partnership with Sacramento City College, which will improve and increase our men's and women's leadership academy programming, especially in the seventh period or expanded learning space and allow us to be more intentional about focusing on supporting college matriculation benchmarks in, during that expanded learning space. We also do some direct service, during this, especially during this time of year. Foster Youth Services started doing re-entry appointments this week in collaboration with Student Hearing and Placement Office. We provide support to foster youth who are new to the district, need, um, have IEPs, or are juvenile justice. Um, involved. We anticipate serving about 25 to 35 students during the next couple of weeks. On August 28th is our back to school nights, opportunity to get backpacks, school supplies, enroll in expanded learning, meet staff, and find out about the other types of supports that are available. And we anticipate serving about 100 foster youth and 70 to 100 students in our American Indian Ed program. Finally, we just concluded two days of professional learning with our expanded learning professionals in our Get Ready Summit. And the theme of the summit this year was change the narrative, tell the story. We served 240 expanded learning staff. And to highlight some of those experiences for you, we have a quick video. The fifth annual Youth Development Get Ready Summit held this year at Luther Burbank High School served to prepare our expanded learning community for the upcoming school year. Approximately 250 expanded learning professionals attended this year's conference, which was designed to create a transformative space where we can learn and grow together. The summit provided opportunities for interactive workshops intended to enhance skill sets, promote innovation, and increase individual impact. These workshops were led by district central office staff from various departments, community experts, and our expanded learning professionals themselves. Keynote speakers included Mark Philpott, Senior Director of Policy Link, Dr. Malika Hollenside, local educator, scholar, activist, ex-NFL player Tyrone Gross Jr., and our Sac City Unified Superintendent Jorge Aguila. The theme of this year's summit was change the narrative, tell the story. Think every time I come to one of these conferences, I just feel very inspired, and I have so much to take back to site with me. Um, I think I learned a lot about building relationships with our students. I know that sometimes we get caught up wanting to build the trust too quickly, too soon, and it's good that they've. Um, I feel like I've learned ways to kind of make myself more vulnerable to students, kind of take those baby steps to make them feel like they can really open up to me. And I know it's gonna be Uh, we just got out of a workshop right now and, and how to deal with uh, certain situations in working with different demographics of students, how to uh, work with them and their families and where they're coming from, pick their brain a little bit and get to see you know, what are their goals and so forth um, in order to create quality programming. And so I think that was a takeaway for today. Um, and we were really, really excited about that as well. Take pride in your resistance. You are here because your love will not allow you to remain complacent as this system targets our youth of color. 
You are here because you believe in a future different than the one our system has created for our young people. You are here today because you understand that every extra minute you invest in developing your own skill set as an expanded learning professional, you are in turn making your own students stronger. Radically reimagine your purpose. You are not just a team lead, an instructional aide, a program manager, a youth service specialist, a social worker, a coordinator, or a director. You are the front lines of the great resistance movement. You are the resistance. Push back and push forward. Change the narrative and tell the story. I am the resistance. I am my ancestors' wildest dream. I am the oppressor's worst nightmare. I am here to serve. I am here to fight. I am here to break this system down. I am here to change this narrative. I am here to tell this story. This is my purpose. This is my purpose. This is my purpose. Wonderful. Thank you. What a wonderful video. Do we have public comment on this agenda item? Not on this specific agenda item now. Then we're going to go ahead and take questions. Board Member Pritchett. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Vice President Ryan. Um, first off, I wanted to thank you for your hard work over the summer to prepare to, for our students coming back to a safe and fun environment and prepared environment. Um, I have some questions throughout it, and some of my questions can be um, responded. I'll let you know by, by um, board communication, then there's some. I'll let you each know. Um, regarding enrollment, Mr. McPeters. Um, first off, thank you for the work that had been done regarding the enrollment um, and pushing it out to some of our sites. I know I had pushed very hard in the past about um, some of our areas that are farther out, like um, the Luther Burbank area and Rosemont area, where it's very hard for families to get to our district office, and especially if they have to come out one or two times because they forgot their paperwork. So thank you for your work on making that happen. Um, the information that I like to see, and you can respond via board communication, I think it'd be interesting for all of us to know um, sitting up here is, um, number one, how successful do you think that that was? How many um, people did you enroll at each site? And also, I, I know that I had some questions that came about because I was sharing you know, every time there was a Facebook post, I'd share it, put it out to my community. And so people were asking me, can we enroll our preschooler? Those are questions I really didn't know. So maybe just a little bit of information about how we can, because um, I, I had no idea. I was like, oh, let me find out for you. <laughs> um, but congratulations. I think that uh, from what I can tell, the response that I got back from, from people in my community, they really liked having something that was localized for them. And um, let's see. Not all of you guys have questions, sorry. <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> um, can you tell me regarding the vacancies that we currently have, are they a wide range of vacancies or are they just specialized subjects? Or, or is it kind of, you know? Kind of a subject vacancies as well as a few single subjects that are Okay. The reason why I ask is, you know, we as board members were always the advocate of trying to find new teachers for our district. So we need to know what, what is available and what should we be pushing. So my next question is, um, do we currently have a um, incentive for, let's say, an elementary school teacher that maybe we could train to become a Spanish teacher or a French teacher um, where there might be a lot of vacancies? Not, no incentive, but we definitely have great in-house credential specialists that can look at <coughs> someone's Okay, so I know that that's probably something that we need to be working with the teachers union on. We can't just make those unilateral decisions, but superintendent, I'd like to make that request that we look into finding how we can train our own to be in those specialized, hard to find positions. Um, Mr. Turkey. <laughs> 
Uh, you had mentioned regarding uh, finding uh, or putting the new curriculum into schools, and um, I know that we've in the past had um, some of our school sites. In particular, I think it was West Campus. We had a parent that had come with an old book and said, hey, these, this is what's happening in our school. Can you tell me where we're at on that? And the, uh, well, if you can give us an update. So um, those were in social studies, I believe. It was um, West History. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, we have they are actually choosing new curriculum. So, yeah, they're actually choosing curriculum right now. So, that book that we saw was that from an AP course? And have you evaluated the rest of the books within the district to make sure that, that we don't have children learning from very aged books and? So in terms of the, um, we're looking at kind of hopefully going towards kind of rolling curriculum. So mm -hmm. ELA, ELD, okay. So looked at all of those to see, okay, well, which ones would need, okay, so that we know which ones we need to. So what you're saying is some of our older textbooks were from our AP classes. Okay. The people who came last year um, were from the AP. That was just an example of because we had, I just used that because we had someone come to the board meeting. But I know just from being in classrooms myself, I've seen or having children in the district and they're bringing home books. I'm like, whoa, how, let me look at this book, right? And so I just want to know, like, you are evaluating of what's in our classrooms. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Victoria. Yes, there you are. Um, and this could be in a board communication. Maybe you guys can all combine this in a board communication. Um, the 2,804 shots that were given, who was um, giving, giving those shots? Were they our nurses? They were. Okay, that was actually my only question for you. I just want to know who was administering them. And, um, oh, and I know one other thing. Um, how are we getting our families to the location here at the enrollment center, um, like getting the word out to the families? Are we doing a connected on this? Yeah, I, if you can, if you can check, I think it would be important to do a connected because not everybody has the internet to be able to look on our website or to receive an email, but most people have cell phones now. So um, if we can maybe help as board members, maybe we can do an, each a robocall to our families um, to help them get out to your location and get our kids updated. Um, sorry, one more thing. Elliot. <laughs> All of the new computer technology that you've rolled out, can you please send us a board communication to what locations and what items? I know that's probably going to be a very intricate list, but just some basics of like this, how many computers were sent to this school site, and just so we have an idea of who got what. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Pritchett. I want to take the opportunity to thank the entire team for the tireless work you've put into onboarding our school year seamlessly. We're so grateful for the many hours you put in for our students and families day in, day out. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that you have taken the feedback from community members and board members about strengthening our enrollment processes, ensuring that we're preserving and growing our youth programming over the summer, and providing providing the appropriate support such as the immunization clinic given recent changes to state law for our families and I'm very grateful for all that you do. Good job. Thanks. So at this time, we're going to go to item 8.0, public comment. I want to remind the public before we go to public comment that we have a tight agenda today, and I'm really asking you to stick to your two-minute time limit. This is going to be our public comment on non-agendized board items. So we have seven public speakers. If the first four could line up, please. 
in order. And Eric? Alex, I'm going to have you hold for one second before you read the names of the public that will be speaking this evening. I do want to say that um, to kick off public comment, the Board of Education would like to share a statement with you. In light of recent violence in Charlottesville, we felt it was extremely important to really make a clear statement to our students and families that we're standing with them through a great deal of fear and uncertainty. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Board Member Mai Vang who has been a courageous leader in asking for us to offer these supports to our families across the district. Thank you, Vice President Jesse Ryan. Um, given all that has happened in Charlottesville and across the nation, it's important for us as a district to take a stand against hate and bigotry. As we welcome back our students in two weeks, it's important for us to ensure our students, our families, and our school community that our classrooms, our campuses, and our work site will be safe havens for our students. These are times when we must not be silent. We must continue to engage in courageous and intentional dialogue against hate in our own homes, community, and schools. This week, our district will be releasing a statement on Charlottesville, and I'll be reading it tonight on behalf of our board. The tragic events in Charlottesville are a sad reminder that racism, hate, and bigotry are still very much alive in our society. These are incredibly challenging times for our nation and its youth, and a strong reminder of why our district designated itself a safe haven school district. Our children are watching these events playing out on their television screens and social media outlets and through our country, and through our country has made incredible progress, and though our country has made incredible progress on equality and civil rights over the past century, there are real threats to that progress. Our safe haven resolution is an example of that progress. It's an example of the progress we have made in fostering a society that welcomes and accepts all people regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and or status. The district calls on all of our community, parents, and educators to join together in reminding our youth that we must unite against hateful rhetoric and acts of violence. It is completely unacceptable and has no place in our society. The ideology espoused by white supremacy groups in Charlottesville this weekend and elsewhere endangers the unity of our nation and we condemn it. As educators and parents, we must come together to teach our children to embrace love, diversity, and equality. Our focus on providing students and families a space free from fear through our safe haven efforts must be prevalent throughout our campuses and community as we strive to stand in solidarity to the hate that continues to plague our communities. Thank you, Board Member Vang. So, yes. <clears throat> Again, we are committed to continuing to lead the way to combat hate rhetoric and to say to our families that racism intolerance has no place in Sac City Unified School District. So as we start the school year, once again, we are proud to be a safe haven and to have the backs of students and families across Sac City Unified. And we're going to go ahead at this time and open it up to public comment. Okay, so if you could line up in order, please. Erica Johnson, G. Young Han, Darlene Anderson, and Bruce Tran, in that order. Hi, good evening. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to try and speak as clearly as I can. My name is Erica Johnson. I'm here on John Steele K-8 behalf regarding the HIPPO program that we do have at our school. Me as a parent, I have three children, and in order for me to get them to a doctor, it's like a two-month wait. And I think having the HIPPO program in the school is a very good great opportunity, especially for parents that can't take off from work to take their kids to the doctor to go sit for like three hours for the same thing that school nurse can do for our children. Um, I don't have transportation to get back and forth to a doctor, and when I do, it's like a two, three month wait before I can even get my kids in there. And it's for like little minor things like 
um, high temperature or headaches or something. And them going to the school nurse is really helping me out a lot because I can't get to a doctor. It's like $20 for me and my kids to get on the bus. And I really do think it's a great opportunity towards for our school too because our kids are not missing school. They have the nurse right there to help out parents that can't take off from work to go sit into a doctor's office. And parents is losing pay at work and kids are kind of missing out on what they're learning at school, missing out. So I really do think the HIPAA program is a very good, great program for our schools to have. And I would really like it to continue, not just me, but many other parents would really like for it to continue rolling and it will help a lot of us out. Thank you and you guys have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Aguilar and board members. My name is Chiyoung Han. I graduated from UC Davis with a degree in biological science and minor in human development. I'm here to ask you to recognize all of the components to a wellness policy and to advocate for telehealth in schools. During my time as a health access advocate intern, I was exposed to children and parents coming from low income level families that were many times chronically absent due to their withholding illnesses that could have been easily prevented and treated already if they had faster access to medical care. I saw kids receive quality health care with an access to doctor evaluation, over the counter drugs, and prescription medications. As we are all well aware of, the student's readiness to receive public education is tied to many things, but especially to physical health. The majority of families in low-income areas face barriers accessing health care, such as transportation or long waits for appointments. During my senior year of college, I developed a desire to pursue nursing, but it is through my time as an intern here that I developed a desire to become a public health nurse. HIPOMD doctors have served over 4,000 students over the past two years. They have allowed your students to gain access to health care right at their school sites, to the kind of medical care that nurses alone are limited to give. We need to now lead by example through providing avenues for these vulnerable students who don't have a voice. HIPOMD will allow higher quality medical care through collaboration effort of our nurses with the doctors. I myself am looking forward to a long career whereby telehealth is used as one of the many tools to reach our vulnerable population. Let us invest in the future of our next generation. Please help HIPPOMD come back to Sacramento City Unified School District again. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Darlene Anderson. I just wanted to talk a little bit about a board policy that wasn't listed tonight, and that's the promotion and retention policy. I don't know what it is. I've tried to see it. But I do know that there are lots of problems in Sac City with kids who are, who are not graduating. And for whatever reason, 11th grader could be in the 11th grade and not have credits to be there, but still listed as 11th grader. And then in 12th grade, they're given a letter saying that they've aged out of services and unfortunately they can not continue in the district anymore. And so it's kind of blatant right now because it's happening to a lot of African American children. I looked at the American Legion's data online from CDE. I looked at Capital Cities. I looked at the Success Academy and very, very small amounts, 20%, 16%, very small amounts of children are meeting grade level proficiency. Yet, I just looked at African Americans, so that's my concern. And so when I look district wide, it's an issue. But I've also put a public request in to see how many kids were making it to grade level or getting grade level credits from the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. I requested that data and I wanted to know how many kids transitioned from our district to a third party provider and how many kids transitioned to the alternative educational. Uh, program that's being run by Sac City Unified School District simply because even if they do graduate from those programs, they're not educated enough to get a job in Sacramento. So since the offer of FAPE is that you'll be functional after 12 years in this school district, and a lot of parents really don't understand what that means, that you'll be able to get out and get a job, 
and they don't know how to fight for their children. And so it's so critical that we start figuring out what we do to hold districts accountable. And one thing I did want to mention, I've asked for data before. They said it's not something we normally collect and they can't do it. Well, I talked to CDE and they said, yes, they can get the data. It might take them longer, but they can still get the data. So I, I expect I'll send that data to the board and expect to get it. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Hello, Mr. Superintendent, board members, and of course, student board member. My name is Bruce Strand. I am a part of the Lemon Hill community uh, right across the block. I am a senior of John F. Kennedy High School. I am also a journalist for Access Sacramento. I want to bring the attention to the board, the attention of the dress code of the district. It is an important issue to me and a student of John F. Kennedy High School. As some of you may know, I have created a petition to change the dress code John F. Kennedy High School and I've gained over 500 signatures as well as support from parents. Many parents heard what I did and have come out to express their concern to me. One parent was furious that his daughter was sent home from school because she wore a tank top. Another was even angrier that her daughter missed a calculus test due to having shoulders. That to me is quite ridiculous. You still might see a trend here. That female students are the one who's being affect, mostly affected by this. Dress code affects all the students, but it is primarily discriminatory against female students. Now, I'm not arguing that you should allow students to wear a bikini to school. That is absurd. <laughs> One argument presented present to me about the dress code is that boys will be boys, and that to me is not good because school is the place that you're holding everyone accountable. You're teaching accountability and responsible responsibility to the students. So if you're removing the responsibility from the boys by saying that, oh, it's the female student fault that the boys are not doing their work, <coughs> then you are being backward with that. So I hope that the board will keep my statement in mind about dress code policy and strive for a better one. Thank you so much, Bruce. Board members, my name's Ann Dunphy. I am raising my two grandchildren after my daughter passed away four years ago. And it, it has been very hard because me and my husband are both disabled. And it, it takes a lot out of us, a whole lot. So with the, I feel that the HIPAA is detrimental to our schools. For people like me and other students that, you know, that have other things going on where it's hard for them to get to a doctor. Um, and it just eliminates all these little tiny doctor's appointments for me, you know? One for head lice, which is a common thing in this school right now. I know my granddaughter had it millions of times last year. So um, countless times, you know, I'd have to go to the doctor if it hadn't been for this program. You know, I, I, I thank God that I didn't have to go to all those appointments because it would have been really hard on us. So, yeah, I think it's detrimental to the school they have this program. I really do, especially for the low-income families and stuff like that. You know, we're struggling. We're all struggling to make it, you know. Um, yeah, so I think it's very detrimental. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Intendant and members of the board. My name is Talis Dayton. I'm here on behalf of the Meadowview community. Um, as a parent from Meadowview, once again, um, I'm talking about the HIPPO MD program. Um, unfortunately, when Freeport closed down years ago, um, we fought really hard in Meadowview to keep Freeport open. But as I said then, that it wasn't just a school closing, it was taking away a part of our community. With that loss, we also lost um, Health for All, which was located on the campus, which affected our students and a lot, not just the students that go to JFK, or sorry, my daughter just graduated um, from John Still and is now going to JFK. But um, So not just the parents there at the school, we have no health care in our community anymore. If you have no vehicle, you are taking a bus for a minimum of two hours to get to an appointment. And so it's a vital part of our community at this point, um, as is most of the other programs at John Still that we've 
benefited so much as a community. And each little piece of that that takes away, it takes away from the whole Meadowview as a whole. So it's vital that we keep that program. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We have four speakers on charter petitions. If you could come up in order, please, and your handouts will be shared. Norman Hernandez, Peter Cordero, Lee Yang, and Jason Sample. Yes, go ahead. Hello, board. Hi. Super, uh, Superintendent, everyone, nice to meet you. Mr. Wu, good seeing you again. I've met all of you except for my Bang and Ms. Cochran worked with your wife quite a bit, um, Rachel, but I'm here to present our, um, from, from, so I'm the superintendent, director of Solarius College Preparatory, and today I'm just here to uh, present our, uh, our intent to renew, um, which will be submitted on, our petition will be submitted on September 8th, 2017, to the superintendent's office for renewal. Um, and that's really all I came to do, I just confirm that it's being submitted to you. You Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Any questions? No. no. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar. <clears throat> My name is Pete Cordetto. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for AIM at the Public Schools. And I'm here to uh, confirm tonight's submittal of two uh, signed letter of petition intents, as well as a petition of insurance and disclosures for two new, hopefully, public charter schools in the Rancho Cordova area serving that community, Rancho Cordova Elementary and Sacramento Charter Academy. We intend to deliver the required petitions and appendices on September 8th to the superintendent's office. Thank you very much. Good evening, Pres uh, Vice President Ryan and Wu and the rest of the board members. My name is Lee Ya. I'm the superintendent of Urban Charter Schools Collective. Well, with me tonight are our project managers, uh, Dr. Dennis Ma and uh, Ms. Chandra Roten. We currently operate Yapisho Academy located in the Pocket neighborhood here in Sacramento. We are here tonight with two submittals for you, the signed letter of petition intent and the petition assurances and uh, disclosures. Urban Charter Schools Collective is intending to deliver the required quantity of petitions and appendices on September 8th, uh, between 8th and noon to Superintendent Aguilar's office, per the timeline required by Sacramento City Unified School District. You should have the documents by now. If not, the Chief Communication Officer has them, and you will get them sometimes this evening. Thank you very much for your time, and have a good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Board Vice President Ryan, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar. Uh, my name is Jason Sample, and I'm the Chief Communications and Strategy Officer for Gateway Community Charters. And tonight I'm here with uh, lead petitioner, Dr. Cindy Peterson, as well as our Assistant Superintendent, Michael Gillespie, to confirm that we have uh, submitted our signed letter of petition and intent, as well as our petition insurances. And we also want to let you know that we do intend to submit a petition and the required quantities on September the 8th uh, between the hours of uh, 8 a.m. to noon to uh, the superintendent's office. Uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to partnering with you. Um, we have one comment, if you'll just hold for one minute. Board member Michael Minnick. I just wanted to, um, uh, Mr. Sample, thanks for, for coming. I just wanted to say thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to check out your um, your site and uh, I'm I'm excited that uh, this project that already exists in our community uh, at the potential for that to be you know part of what we're doing here I think you guys are doing amazing stuff so thanks for coming tonight great thank you trustee Minnick thank you for your time do we have any other public comments no more comments hearing no other public comments we're going to move to Item 9.0, adopting the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Move. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? Hearing none, we're going to go ahead and adopt the agenda. 
Item 10.0, Board Workshop and Strategic Plan and Other Initiatives. 10.1, Approve the Single Plans for Student Achievement for K-12 Schools, which will be presented by Superintendent Aguilar and Elliot Lopez. Good evening, Vice Pre first Vice President Ryan, uh, board members, and Superintendent Aguilar. Uh, my name is Elliot Lopez. I'm the Chief Information Officer, and I'm here with Kathy Morrison, our district's LCAP and SIPSA coordinator. Tonight, we bring forward for board approval each school's single plan for student achievement, or SIPSA. Board approval of the plans is a prerequisite for the expenditure of funds and execution of activities identified in these plans. We will provide an overview of the purpose and function of the SIPSA, and we will discuss some of the initial areas for future improvement. Prior to your approval, we will also provide a high-level overview of the contents of these 74 plans and their alignment to our LCAP and we will touch upon planned fund expenditures. The SIPSA is the vehicle for school leaders to define and articulate the strategy for improving student achievement at their individual schools. The plan contextualizes the LCAP goals at the school level, as well as the federal LEA plan goals and it promotes local prioritization based on specific needs at each site. The SIPSA undergoes multiple levels of review and is ultimately approved at the school level by the principal, the site council, and additional parent committees that may exist, such as the ELAC, Special Ed Committee, or the PTA. As such, the SIPSA is a valuable and powerful tool for establishing alignment and coherence. Good evening, Vice President Ryan, board members, and Superintendent Aguilar, and Kathy Morrison. Per California Ed Code, all school SIPSAs are structured to consistently include these elements. As the plan is developed, sites must propose goals and actions based on a needs assessment that looks at all relevant data. Ed code also requires that each school identify protocol, protocols that will be employed to measure performance each year in the spring. Ensuring a democratically elected school site council is a critical part of the process. Ed code specifies the composition of each school site council so that stakeholder groups at each school are fairly represented from teachers to parents to students at the secondary level. Each school's budget includes both state funds, the LCFF Supplemental and Concentration Grant, as well as federal funds. The use of these funds must be described in the SIPSA. A few examples of activities that school sites may choose to include in their plan are intervention by a resource teacher, additional collaborative time to review data, plan lessons, ensure articulation between grades, tutoring before or after school, support for English learners, counseling or school-based mental health services, and parent workshops and other events that increase family and community engagement. The California Department of Education recommended process for developing the SIPSA is a year-round effort with overlap in the timeline as some activities take place simultaneously. Analyzing student data is ongoing throughout the year as results are released. The principal serves as the educational leader in this process and shares data that identifies performance gaps. In addition to new data resources under development, reports currently available include standardized achievement tests, the progress of English learners, 
attendance, and chronic absence, to name a few. The new California School Dashboard can also serve as a snapshot to evaluate the school's progress based on state accountability measures. Once school goals are defined, the School Site Council identifies strategies and actions to improve student outcomes. These strategies must be research-based and effective. School Site Council meetings are open to the public and follow the stipulations of the Brown Act with a posted notice of the meeting and agenda. During the course of the year, the School Site Council responsibilities are twofold. While the council monitors the implementation of the current plan, they also evaluate the efficacy of the current SIPSA as they plan for the next year. Finally, in late spring, the draft plan is submitted to the district for review by staff. It is approved by school site council and submitted to the board for approval. This illustrates the cyclical nature of the SIPSA and how it mirrors the cyclical nature of the LCAP. Engagement with stakeholders as well as ongoing review of data is encouraged throughout the year. Our communication is cyclical as well. We reach out to principals annually to offer training, funding guidance, and reminders about the timeline. In the last school year, we provided training to 14 site administrators and to 17 school site councils. For the first time last year, we convened the School Site Council Learning Collaborative to provide information for school site council members on both Title I and the local control funding formula and LCAP. Superintendent Aguilar has already asked us to begin considering improvements to the SIPSA process. For example, some of the areas that we are currently looking at include transparency, so making SIPSA drafts available in all requisite languages and increasing transparency throughout the process, oversight and monitoring, having annual and mid-year reviews to ensure the fidelity uh, of each plan, and support and facilitation, so expanded site council training and uh, modification of the timeline. Tonight, we will ask for the board's approval of the SIPSAs for 2017-18. Once we receive approval, we'll proceed with posting the final documents, translating the SIPSAs for each school site, and advising principals that funds are released for the year. Thank you so Thank you. much. Before we go to questions from the board, do we have any public comment on this item? We have two public comments, Darlene Anderson and Liz Guillen. Good evening, Darlene Anderson. Considering that I was a DAC chair for, I guess, two years, and I was the vice chair at one time before they closed the DAC and they shut it down, and then they chose to select parents to participate on the LCAP, and then they only have one or two parents that actually participate. This has been a journey. I have I participated on every school site council that I've ever, my kids have ever gone through it. I have a 30-year-old, so I've been doing this for a long time. And what I'll say about parent involvement is nil to none in this district. And they work hard to eliminate people's voices. So when you don't train through Title I, you don't train at all. Because the law gives you some, you know, some power to educate parents. But if you're not doing parent involvement, you don't have accountability. I had special needs children. Special education does not participate in the single plan for student achievement. Although you have kids at the district, I mean, in the district that are special ed, they're only getting services from the district. There are not special ed parents who are trained, participating at school site council level. I can say that it's easier not to have parent involvement. It's easier not to generate the voices of all, simply because you get to work independently and do what you think is better. 
but it doesn't increase graduation, it doesn't increase student success, it just doesn't work. But it does save people's jobs. People are employed. I mean, how do you think that you haven't been able to lower the willful defiance issue in the African American community and you haven't even addressed it in the LCAP? It's pretty disgusting <coughs> to me to take dollars that are guaranteeing jobs for 12 years for students and then they don't get to graduate. So no, I, I didn't get to see the, L, the SIPSAs this year. I didn't go online to try to figure out where they would be hiding, but there's no place you can come and see them either. So I don't know who participated, but usually it's only one parent at the school site and they're not training parents. So thank you. Thank you for your comments, Darlene. Liz? Good evening, uh, board members, superintendent. I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Um, I really appreciate the presentation uh, by Mr. Lopez and Ms. Morrison. Um, it was so much clearer than uh, we have seen in the past, and it's really good to understand that improvements are underway and have been identified. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out was um, in terms of adherence to the LCAP tenets in relationship to the school, the single plans for student achievement, it's important that the annual update include how school sites are implementing the supplemental dollars that are going to them. So in the uh, LCAP, there's about eight actions and services um, that are indicated as school site level actions. Um, and that's great. This is totally appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, last time I testified, I misspoke and said it was like $40 million, but it's not. It's only $9.8 million. Darn. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to uh, impress upon you as you work toward um, the mid-year uh, reviews uh, and the monitoring that that link back to the LCAP, that that's very important. And that's something that we're not seeing very much or very well in the LCAPs that we have reviewed around the state. Um, it's important that the district monitor that the use of supplemental and concentration dollars is programmed at the school site, either targeting the students that generate those funds, low income, English learner and foster youth, or satisfying the principally directed and effective standards. Um, if every, dis, every school site is doing something different, I know that's a challenge. And I want to encourage tonight parents to participate in this process. There's a lot of stuff in these single plans uh, and the LCAP, and it's a real opportunity uh, to make decisions at your school site with real money. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Gann. So we're going to go ahead and take questions. I actually have a question that I wanted to pose. Um, so you talked about, Kathy, this process for engaging and encouraging at the school site council level. And it sounded to me like a lot of that was moving through the principals themselves. So that you were reaching out to the principals on the communications means, you were reaching out to the principals on the opportunities for training and guidance, um, which I think is essential because these are very complex things to understand otherwise. But it does very much occur to me that then it is also very much leadership driven for the principals to take advantage of that guidance and training. And so I would be very um, eager to hear what you're doing to actually reach out directly to the school site council so that you're not having to rely upon a principal determining that, in fact, this is a good use of time and energy to empower the parents, educate the parents with additional information on these funds. So once... Uh Depending on the site, some schools have their site council elections in the spring. Uh, some often middle school because of the two-year timeline. Often middle school or high school may not do their election until the fall. That's a locally driven process. So once those leaders are identified, that would be our conduit to reaching out to the parents who are on the site councils. Um, it looks like we have a comment from board member Vang. Oh, board member Wu. 
<laughs> Thank you, Vice President Ryan. So, um, as chair of the Budget Committee, and I want to thank Member Vang for bringing it to the Budget Committee's attention, and it was dis a discussion, in fact, about engaging uh, school site councils and thinking of ideas to invigorate the school site councils. And I think it was Vicki who came to speak to us about school site councils with Gerardo. It was Lisa Hayes. Lisa Hayes, that's right. I'm sorry. Um, and um, we were hoping that um, uh, you from the LCAP would, would come at the same time, but it didn't happen. But uh, the only reason I want to uh, saying this is that I want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Anderson's uh, concerns. Uh, we also have those concerns, and we were thinking about ways to um, strategize with Ms. Hayes about how to engage um, school site councils and consider whether or not some of that a small amount of that money, for example, could be used for um, feeding the school site council members with pizza or something like that uh, to so that they wouldn't be skipping out on their... Um, on their uh, family meals to be able to bring their children while they're having these discussions with some babysitting uh, or some uh, daycare uh, being provided on the site. As well, uh, we were talking with Ms. Hayes, working with you to educate the school site councils on the LCAP and, uh, and, and to provide training, in fact, on both the LCAP and um, the, the workings of school site councils uh, in order to make them a much more effective tool for each site administrator. So I'm, I'm uh, mentioning this in, in hopes that uh, you will uh, get together with Ms. Hayes and start rolling out some plan because uh, probably in the next few months, maybe before the spring, uh, the Budget Committee will ask come back and report on uh, what activities uh, have occurred and uh, some sort of indication on the level of success. Thank you. And I will say that um, I work in partnership with Lisa Hayes and also with the Family and uh, Community Empowerment Department. So this isn't um, the effort of one person. We all need to work together to make sure the trainings and communication go out. Thank you, Thank you so much. And, 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 but the purpose is to make these tools uh, much more effective, and with um, uh, Superintendent Aguilar, I'm hoping that we will in, start entering into an era of continued improvement as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wu, and thank you, Ms. Morrison, for all of your efforts. Thank you. So this is an item for action, so can I please have a motion for adoption of the SIPSA plan? Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Item 10.2, Board Policy 5030, Student Wellness, which will be presented by Ms. Flores. Okay. Thank you. to get this through. Good evening. Vice President Ryan, members of the board, and Superintendent Aguilar. Today we are seeking approval for board policy 5030. My name is Diana Flores. I'm the Acting Nutrition Services Director. This is Victoria Flores. She's Student Support and Health Services Director, and we represent the District Wellness Committee. Two weeks ago, we stood before you. Sorry. Two weeks ago, we stood before you on August third board meeting for the first reading of board policy 3050. There were many questions raised during that meeting. Many questions were raised, like, "May schools sell food during the school day now? Will celebrations be held after school? Will, will those be affected? Will football or basketball concessions, any sporting concessions, be affected?" What about cultural events? <clears throat> With the passage of the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act in 2010, 
New federal and state competitive food regulations require food and beverage sales, including all food fundraisers, meet specific nutrition guidelines. But seems to be of greatest concern at the first reading was that can students sell food on campus during the school day at all anymore? Yes, as long as they meet the specific nutrition guidelines required. To represent what food sales would look like during the school day, if this policy were approved tonight, a student store could use the vendor order form on our district website. They can select different items that are compliant from the, a specific vendor, items like Sun Chips, Nutrigrain Bars, or Goldfish Crackers, many brands that students recognize today. If they wanted to sell some other item that wasn't listed on that compliant order form, they could simply use the Project Lean calculator also available on our website. They would enter simple nutritional facts labels from those items into this calculator, and it would tell them whether it was compliant or not. Things like the calories, the serving size, the fat, and the sugar. And it would say yes or no, it is compliant or not. Good evening, I'm Victoria Flores, Director of Student Support and Health Services, and I'll address the rest of this part. So fundraising after school, there seem to be a lot of questions about that. And again, we want to reiterate that athletic concessions are not regulated by this wellness policy as long as they're sold the 30 minutes after the end of the standard school day, regardless of grade level. So for any, any school level, that, that would be um, the guidance. We also had a lot of questions around some of the um, cookie dough or seize candy. And so if schools have had successful fundraising with those catalog-based fundraisers, I know I ordered seize candy when I was at Rosa Parks um, for the Easter holiday, um, that is okay as long as parents are handling the distribution. So those schools that are having success with those items can still do those things. But we also really want to encourage other fundraising activities, especially those that either promote physical activity or promote service to our community. Things like this point of sale fundraising, I didn't know what that meant mm -hmm. until I was at Macy's and I was asked if I wanted to round up on my purchase and donate to Sacramento, Sacramento area schools. I was like, yes, that's so <laughs> cool. You know, so, so things like that that I'm hoping we as a district can go out and, and um, encourage. Jogathons, walkathons, play your violinathon read-a-thon, right? Whatever we can get to get our students to be active or learning. E-waste, which is a really great service to our communities, right? Helping our communities with that e-waste. Also things like promoting school spirit wear that promote positive school culture and climate. Um, and then of course those public social me media campaigns that click and fund. We like those too. Um, so in, in, um, in summary, we created this little grid that we're hoping is helpful, and we will continue to refine it and work on it. Um, but on the left are the different activities um, or events, and on the right are the regulations or really the wellness policy guidelines that would apply. And our focus was really on ensuring students are sold and served foods that promote health and wellness while they're in school with us. That was really our intent here. Um, so as you'll see, there's an exception to that. If they're in a course um, and it's got an educationally related content, they can sample that food. We had the great uh, example of a chemistry course where the students got to make ice cream. Of course they get to sample their ice cream, right? You got to watch the magic of science. So we hope that this is helpful for you in understanding what applies and what doesn't and what will be outside of it. So tonight, we asked the board um, to adopt our revisions to board policy 5030. We understand that this policy will take effect immediately, and so we will really spend 17, 18 re-engaging all those student groups that we worked with, our parent groups, schools. We will assist, and we are dedicated, we've got dedicated groups of people um, to assist in any of those fundraising concerns or efforts that come up. And we are gonna work um, diligently to develop the administrative regulations that will really help guide our district in how to implement this policy. We will spend 18, 19 engaging in that cycle of inquiry. What worked, what didn't, what do we need to change, we might be back with you uh, again, we hope not, but you know, we will if we need to, to make sure we get it right. 
um, and we will spend 1920 really assessing and evaluating our implementation of the policy. So in, in closing, um, I would ask all the District Wellness Committee members that are here tonight to stand up and be recognized. Um, and I just want to say, yes, thank you. Um, and I have the honor and the pleasure of saying on behalf of this committee, we really thank you for your time and your consideration. Yes, thank you so much for your service. I know it was an 18-month labor of love. Before we open it up to questions from the board, I would like to take public comment. And if I can remind the audience, since I know we have several public comments, to please keep your comments to two minutes to be respectful of others' time. We have six public comments. If you could come up in order, please. Bruce Tran, followed by Tom McElhaney, John Perryman, Paul Sommerhausen, Darlene Anderson, and Paul Towers. Please come up to the front and stand in order. Uh, so you know who I, so you know who I am already. So I'm gonna skip straight to the point. Uh, I want to say that I give my full support to this proposal. There's no points to oppose it since, to my knowledge, it is a matter of state and federal law. Stopping junk food in school is one of the key steps to solve the problem of unhealthy eating and obesity. However, it should not be the only step a district takes. I want to say that if a district seeks to eliminate obesity, then it should be involving parents and communities in this effort. Why I say that is because due to my experience as a journalist, I have found out that many areas with the highest rate of obesity are also some of the poorest. Those communities have close ethnic groups, for example, the Hmong community. Those groups are not often being reached out to enough. In addition to that, most of the areas those groups live in are food desert. For example, you have Meadowview and Green Haven, two areas that are very close together, only separated by Freeport Boulevard. You can literally see the difference in food option in those two large communities when you cross the road. One is the food desert while the other is a food haven. It is valiant of a district to have a student eating healthy in school. However, those efforts are in vain once those, when those same students return home to unhealthy eating. The rules and food regulation will be meaningless if it is canceled out. That's why the community outreach is essential for reducing obesity among the students of Sacramento Unified School District. I hope the district listens to my advice in, in enhancing effort to reach out to the community and the parent to promote healthy eating. Thank you so much, Bruce. Good evening. Happy Thursday, board members. I'm glad to see all of you. To show my perspective in where we are on weighing our proposed wellness policy revisions, I want to make a brief comparison between SB 328, the bill that's moving through the California legislature uh, for late start for middle and high schools, uh, and our wellness policy here. My point in the SB 328 debate all along has been that although there may be inconveniences created by implementing late start, it should be our pleasure to work on those problems as problem-solving adults because of the good we are doing. Well, there will be inconveniences with this wellness revision. After all, a wise man once said, changing your diet is like grabbing a tiger by the tail. Let us embrace those inconveniences. Let us love them. Let us send those inconveniences then on their way. Our district's people know that we are due for a change. Tonight, we denounce the sweet temptations that have reigned, the misery of ill health upon our heads, upon the health of our students. And in doing so, we teach a desperately needed lesson. It's raining sugar. Tonight, the tireless shield of research to defend our actions, we proclaim that our classroom shall be a steadfast shelter from that rain. Dear board, yes, we have provided and will continue to provide alternatives to these sales. And in a world where assaults on our students' health come from many directions, 
we can then say, the school is special, the classroom sacred. To our students, we can say, your protectors are looking out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I got out of order. Okay. Uh, John Perryman, teacher, Luther Burbank High School, a uh, long time since 87 in the district. I'm going to abandon my prepared comments. Food is a part of culture. And practically every culture on the planet uses food to celebrate and to gather people. The committee wants to drag the district into a culture war. Social engineering against the parents and various communities. The primary effect will be to distract us from our core mission. The most probable effect will be to damage school community relations. Our surrounding districts have seven page wellness policies that have been properly vetted. Ours is 22 pages long. Very little of it has been properly vetted. I've done my best and the committee has in substantially changed language. But you need to run it past the people who are affected, past the school site administrators, past the teachers in the classrooms, past the ASBs, and get their approval before you do it. Otherwise, you'll have a counter reaction. Since we passed these nutrition regulations, obesity in the high schools have increased, not decreased. And it's a rejection of overreach and over authoritarian behavior. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, board members and superintendent. <clears throat> my name is Paul Sommerhausen. I'm here representing my company, Sacto Mofo, and the about 50 food trucks that I work with to offer my thoughts on the policy uh, uh, in front of you today rel relative to student wellness. I apologize for joining this discussion late, but I was just made aware of it in the last uh, couple of days. While I appreciate and assert I appreciate and certainly understand the importance of having a supportive nutritional plan that improves access to better food for your school district. I'm afraid that while writing this policy, there was an accidental overreach. And we noticed that on, your, on page 11 of your policy outline under the vending heading, it states, and I quote, outside vendor carts, trucks, or vehicles are prohibited from locating within 400 yards from any school ground. An arbitrary and sizable radius of 400 yards would be a potentially devastating effect on our industry as many of your schools are in the midst of dense urban areas where the distance would eliminate many existing legal vending opportunities for us within the city blocks, like for example at Sutter Middle School where we have a monthly market at McKinley Park, uh, which we've been operating for three years. We also have a daily market at Sutter Hospital, which we wouldn't be able to operate anymore because of this arbitrary ban. Additionally, under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, we would ask you to consider that if you're gonna ban food trucks from operating within 400 yards from your schools, you would also have to ban any other similar food vendors that would fall within that distance range, like fast food operators, cornerstones, uh, corner stores, and restaurants. Uh, like I mentioned, on the Sutter Middle School, there's at least 10 food vending establishments that would be directly affected, including places like McDonald's, Safeway, Rite Aid, Del Taco. McClatchy High School has just as many surrounding it. We are also curious what the enforcement mechanism would be uh, to enforce this ban as the school district does not employ environmental health staff, nor does it have parking jurisdiction to cite these potentially offending food trucks. Finally, food trucks also donate thousands of dollars yearly back to the schools when, through partnerships at sporting events and other school activities. This arbitrary ban would eliminate all these funding options. Thank you for allowing me to share our serious concerns with this policy line. We hope you will reconsider and find a better solution to address your goals. I would be happy to work with your staff to facilitate this. Thank you. Thank you. Darlene. Darlene Anderson. So I should have known any time it comes to a policy, it has to do with contracts and contractors. And the parents who came before talking about the HEPA or, or the shots and having the ability, that's not a part of the school, school wellness policy. I was surprised. And I do know that there was a clinic at Freeport Elementary School that the district chose to close. And that was a big help for students 
who are in poverty. That clinic no longer exists. So when you really start talking about student wellness and the amount of children that we have living in poverty with health issues and their families in health issues, the partnership with Sacramento, the city of Sacramento, and our district would have been important to maintain. So I think that, you know, the ability, a lot of things change when the Obamas were in the White House and food policies changed and the lunch menus changed and different contractors. And this is all a part of different opportunities at the behest of our children. Obesity is a problem in America. It's a huge problem. I don't know what happens when you get 500 pounds. How do you lose that weight? How do you get rid of it? We're not doing enough in physical fitness, and I don't think that the policy here is talking about physical fitness. It's talking about opportunities. But I want to see the opportunities more around student wellness, student health, versus opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Stephen? Thank you very much. Board members, some of you I have met, some of you I have not met. I've been out of politics for a number of years, and uh, I'm only back home because of this thing. I assume <laughs> this is a little over to projector works. I'm not, I'm not seeing my document there. Oh, it's over there. Okay, super. Well, that'll tell you. That'll teach you. Great. A couple of things about sure. And, Senior you know, welcome to Sacramento. You have my deepest sympathies and congratulations. <laughs> Having been in a job such as yours, I know exactly what it's like. We need to understand that the school lunch program is owned by the sugar industry. They spend a tremendous amount of money at USDA to make sure that sugar is not regulated. Sugar has no regulation at all. And your wellness policy, by the way, is silent on the amount of sugar that a child should intake. Of the 22 pages, if you go and you do a search, you will not find the word sugar anywhere in the policy. There is no place in the proposed policy where there is a maximum amount of sugar where, children should, or could be, where sugar should be consumed by our children. In other words, the policy is not clearly stated, and to have such is to have none. The USDA has no standard for, an, for a minimum daily allowance for sugar. Everything else has an MDA, everything, but except for sugar. I mean, strychnine has an MDA. <laughs> Salts, vitamins, proteins, all of it the same way. What this chart indicates <clears throat> is from the World Health Organization is the growth of sugar in our country since 1920. Women were dying of uh, diabetes at the end of the Civil War. Women were dying of diabetes at the end of the Civil War because of the amount of sugar that was intake through the use of coffee. Now, we all know and understand that there is a national epidemic of obesity. There's no question about that. So how much is too much? Well, Mr. Superintendent, you're supposed to come up with a coordinated plan, which includes physical education, by the way, on how you're going to deal with this problem. I assume I have a little more, a couple more minutes. Well, Thank you. you're at your two minutes, but I we'll know. let you wrap it up. Our sugar is hidden in Everything. Everything. 11 teaspoons of sugar, 46 grams, is approximately the amount that our students get every day in our school system. 11 teaspoons. The maximum amount that you're supposed to have is less than 24 grams per day. So how do you get there? Well, there's a lot of ways to do it. In the morning cereals, you can have <clears throat> Cheerios, or you can have Rice Krispies. You can have, instead of high fructose corn syrup, we can buy honey from a local supplier. My papers indicate a wellness policy because there is no statement of policy in your wellness plan as to what it is that we need to do. We should have resolved that no more than 12 grams of sugar should be allowed for breakfast in the standard in the strategic plan. Now, what about fundraising? The whole thing that you're dealing with tonight is about fundraising. How many kids are obese in the United States? The number of overweight children is now one out of three. This is what it looks like when you go to the beach. 
And where does it start? It starts with the mother. We don't have the ability to educate our parents right now on what it is that needs to be done. But let me tell you who has control over it. All of you. Now, the LCAP, by the way, I've asked about that program before and uh, have yet to receive any kind of notification of any meetings at Washington Elementary. <clears throat> On behalf of my six, seven year old son and his class, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to deal with this issue. It is a $37 billion problem here in California. $37 billion. We need to attack it here at the elementary school level. And then you can go to all of the funders and you can say, we're doing your job. We need some more money. Thank you so much, Mr. Ibero. We appreciate you. your presentation. My pleasure. So at this time, we are going to, oh, sorry. Can't forget Paul Towers. I'll be, I'll be brief. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you all. Um, all. I don't have any creative visuals, um, but I do want to share a little bit on behalf of the Sacramento Food Policy Council and as a parent of a uh, soon-to-be kindergartner in a couple weeks uh, in Sac City Unified. Um, on behalf of the Sacramento Food Policy Council, we want to support the policy put forth uh, by district staff. Uh, the staff and community members have been working tirelessly on this policy for, for many months uh, and really I think underscores um, the commitment by this district and by our school community to ensuring that our children remain uh, healthy and safe, uh, that they have the support to uh, remain productive and learn, uh, be, learn as much as possible in our school environments. Um, we, um, I think what we see tonight is actually the beginning and uh, sort of there will be an evolution of this policy over time. Uh, the idea is that we won't have everything figured out, um, that we will learn as we go along, and this is meant to be, you know, as, as a district, we are meant to learn about policies and learn how to implement them as well as possible, but there will be tweaks and opportunities. But the challenge before us is real. You know, we've talked about obesity. We've talked about the vast marketing uh, by a handful of corporations that have been shared by some of the other speakers here to push sugar and products into our schools. Uh, but that it's on us to stand up to those powerful interests to ensure the health and safety of our children. Uh, this is again, this is an opportunity as a beginning and it's a step towards ensuring that that health and that that safety for our school community. So really urge and, and ask for your support of this policy and pr remain particularly excited to thinking about how we can best support uh, fundraising opportunities, particularly for um, the poorest in our communities, those that don't have access to the same resources as some of our more um, well-to-do schools and, and parts of the district. So I think that's the, that's the commitment we share in partnership with moving this policy forward. Thank Thanks. you so much, Paul, and thank you to the Sacramento Food Policy Council for your work. So at this time, we're going to take questions from uh, Victoria. I actually want to begin with one. So this is the first time the issue of food trucks has come out. Um, even though we have spent hours in policy committee and I know in the wellness committee meetings themselves, um, walking through the minutia of the policies and making adjustments based on the feedback we've been hearing from hundreds of community members through our online survey, but also in meetings that have consistently occurred over the last 18 months. So let me ask you, on this statement of outside vendor carts, trucks, or vehicles being prohibited from locating within 400 yards from any school grounds, is that an issue of state and federal compliance? Is that specific to school hours? or is that really um, at any times having them located on or around the campuses? My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not in the regulation. However, this was a really a district policy committee uh, recommendation. It was really specifically around when students are letting out or maybe even coming in and around safety. So it's really in response to a lot of the school staff and principals who have to manage those kinds of carts when, you know, I think I shared last time, you know, kids are lining up on corners, you know, and congregating on a corner because the food cart is right there. So, you know, we can, we can check with our legal on that one, but that was the intention of the, 
the committee. So, so this was in response to feedback at the school site level, but this is not an issue of state and federal compliance. Okay, so then can I also ask a, the question, because it doesn't specify, is this, once again, specific to school hours, or does this prohibit the school, um, the trucks and vendors from being within 400 yards at any time surrounding school grounds? I, I, I think Nathaniel's looking something up. However, I'm, I'm hoping we can address that in our administrative regulations. At no point do we intend to regulate food trucks at you know a park uh, far away. This is really about keeping our students safe, and if we mm. can you know do that in our administrative regulations, um, hopefully that would be okay. So I do want to say I would like to see this addressed in detail in the administrative regulation so that we don't have unintended impact. I also think that it's very important to say for the public that you know this document um, has been the result of thousands of hours of input, um, but it is just one piece. The next piece will be the administrative regs, which is really the implementation plan, and we plan to be as involved at the policy committee level and the district level in that as we have been in updating the board policy. Additionally, there has been a commitment made from Superintendent Aguilar that we will provide a toolkit, so resources, so that we provide all alternatives at the school site level and communicate them clearly with parents and others around alternative mechanisms for celebrations and fundraising, as we know that that has been key to the feedback we've received across the district. So at this time, we're going to start with comments from board member Pritchett. Thank you, Vice President Ryan. Okay, where do I start? As you can see, I... <laughs> <laughs> um, as you know, I had many questions at the last board meeting um, because I've received many emails and personal phone calls and people even stopping me in the grocery store asking what is going on, right? So, um, you know, though I want to encourage healthy eating during school hours, it's this graph, um, I, I don't want to discredit your work at all. But I'm still, there's so many unanswered questions for me that I would not know how to go to my community and explain to them this is what the rules are, right? Even by, you know, reviewing this in our board packet, I can't tell what was created uh, as a um, guideline or rule by the policy committee or if it was actually the, the federal law that was handed down, right? So I know that that's going to be some of the questions that people will ask me. Um, so I'm just going to ask some blatant questions. So on here it says um, that, you, that yes, you, they, the uh, regulations do apply during um, school day programming. And I know we asked the question of like, you said it's 30 minutes after the last class, right? Well, at uh, elementary school it could be fourth R. At a high school, it could be banned, which is at like, you know, sometimes nine o'clock at night when I drive by, they're still there. So obviously they're not gonna be doing fundraisers. So how does that lay out through for a school? So for the, the high school, the ninth through 12th grade, and we even reached out to some of our schools that are seventh through 12th, the, the federal regulations say 30 minutes after the standard school day, and that's the way we're defining it in the policy. So we're not extending it to any kind of after school programming. In early kinder through eighth grade, we are extending it to the after school program. That, and that was a place where the committee was making a recommendation and um, going beyond what's regulated to really make sure that we have a commitment, especially in our after school programs, that we're also serving and selling healthy foods. Okay. Because that's such a small uh, percentage of the students that are at the school you know, throughout the day that are, are staying there. Okay, so that, that will be a, a huge impact. Um, thank you, Vice President Ryan, for asking about the food trucks, because I know that in my area, uh, like on Friday nights, we have uh, food trucks that come in at the park that are right behind Einstein Middle School. They come in at 5 o'clock. There's still classes going on, so I want to make sure that that's not going to affect the business, because that's a community event that people come out to. And I'm sure that takes place in most of our areas. Um, you know, is it Mr. Perryman, the, the teacher? 
There he is. Yes. So, you know, I, I got to say you were kind of right on of my thinking at the last board meeting. I don't think you were here at the last board meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of engaging our ASB and uh, parent teacher organizations. And I can you just like weigh in a little bit about that and how you engage them or if they were engaged at all during this process? So we, we did an online survey. We went out and met with any ASB or parent group that would let us in and, and talk with us. And so we, we did as much engagement as, you know, we could, um, really trying to get those voices back. Did you meet with the Student Advisory Council? I don't believe we did. Yeah, I have a lot of concern about that just because these are the groups that are going to be impacted the most and then they weren't engaged. And I appreciate that we did an online survey, but a lot of our communities don't even have internet. They don't have a way to take a survey. So I have, I have a lot of concern about that. Um, and, you know, how do we engage them or even educate them? And I'm afraid that we're, though I think that this is important, I kind of feel like we're jumping into decision without getting their input, which is we're going to get the, the uh, that, that negative feedback from. Um, Let me read through my notes real quick. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I at the last board meeting, uh, Member Cochran and I really um, had spoke about how this is going to affect some of the um, the fundraising that takes place. And I'm sure that you're aware that it's going to affect it. And I know I had asked the superintendent maybe um, evaluating how we can help supplement these groups to make sure that you know, that certain programs still might take place, like, for example, um, you know, cleaning of band uniforms or, you know, uh, for a play, they might need props. And it's fundraising that takes place after school to be able to purchase that because there's no school funds to be able to purchase that. And so I'm a little worried about how this is going to affect it, right? And I know that you gave us a list of, you know, um, uh, suitable snacks that they can sell, um, but I know in my area, just, I think I told you, you know, I used to be a PTA president. I had two kids and went to the school. I remember baking stuff and sending it to school. And I, from my understanding, this, no more of that. And that's a regulation. Yeah, that's a that's... federal regulation. Okay. Those are the kind of things that I need to know. So, and I'm, I'm trying to play through this in my mind because I'm feeling uncomfortable because when I go to my community, they're going to have those questions and want to know why we can't do certain things anymore. Um, I, uh, superintendent, I know at the last board meeting, I also mentioned about lunch lines and because we have certain fundraisers from, especially at high school, well, at particular high schools, um, that, uh, groups like say ASB or the parent teacher organizations that will have fundraisers throughout the day, but it allows more options and it could be healthy options. I'm not saying that it's junk food at all. Could be healthy options. Um, but a big concern has been the lunch lines at high schools. And I know in particular at Rosemont High School, they get, I think it's a 25 minute lunch for 1200 students. That's too long. That's too, not too much time. It's too long of a line for 20 minutes. Not every kid will eat. They skip lunch. They don't eat anything. And how healthy is that? I'd much rather have my kid grab a goldfish or something. You know what I mean? So I just want to make sure that we're evaluating this whole process and all and making sure that if we're going to be making big adjustments like this, then we need to be looking at the entire picture. Um, you know, once again, I, um, oh, you know, I did have a question. How does this affect teachers on campus? Like, you know, so a teacher brings their lunch to school, they go into the teacher's break room, they crack open a Pepsi because they've had a long day. <laughs> We're really encouraging our teachers to model healthy behavior, but it does not regulate what <laughs> students bring from home, what teachers bring from home, what they choose to eat in the, the lounge. That's, this is not effective. Of course, we want our teachers, though, to maybe not crack the Pepsi um, in a water bottle of water, but they, they absolutely can't. But we can't, can't control no. people like that. No. It's not our job to parent well, a teacher. Bring from home. 
or okay. what students nor, bring from nor yeah. students bring from home. Yeah, this so, is this is only about the food served and sold yeah. during the day. As you can tell, I feel really uncomfortable, and it's not that I feel uncomfortable with the healthy eating or the policy. I feel uncomfortable that there hasn't been enough advocacy or um, getting out to the people that it's going to affect the most. And so, what, you know, like I said, I don't want to discredit the work because I know there was countless hours that went into this, but. You have to respect me for making a decision for the people that I represent. So, thank you. Um, before we go to Board Member Cochran, um, two items that I do want to suggest in response to President Pritchett's concerns. I would love, as we go into the administrative regs um, phase, to make the suggestion that board members who would like to engage their area in particular host dialogues to talk about how this can be implemented in such a way that informs and empowers parents and educators to do this in the interest of the best health of students, but to also understand that we are in large part complying with state and federal law. The other piece is I would like to ask the district to charge the district with the development of a one-pager front to back with very clear visuals and a side-by-side -side around how these items are coming in line with state and federal compliance so that we have a very easy handout that we can provide at each of our school sites and that show that the vast majority of the policies that we're putting forward are allowing us to be in compliance with state and federal law. Board Member Cochran. Thank you very much, uh, Acting President Ryan. Uh, this is um, uh, interesting because um, I agree with 90% uh, of what's in here. And um, if we have state and federal regs, we're not going to fight the state and federal regs uh, from this dais or uh, in the creation of the policy. Um, but like I sta stated last um, board meeting, uh, someone who's actually... Uh, run clubs and yeah, had to earn that money and send people places and get uniforms cleaned. It is a hugely difficult thing to do. I appreciate the alternatives that you provided in one of the slides. Um, I have a question that's just a general discussion. It might involve a question to our attorney and also uh, to our acting president. So the, the 400 yards is interesting uh, because the gentleman who represents the MOFO uh, uh, clientele, particularly called out uh, the area that I represent, which is Sutter Middle School, and I'm intimately familiar with the activities that go on at McKinley Park. I imagine that when you uh, thought about the safety of the children, you weren't thinking of his trucks. You were thinking of perhaps the vendors that come with the ice cream and um, maybe the illegal vendors that uh, are being addressed also by the city. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you have a, a policy that you want to put in place, it has to be clean. And we've got an industry here that uh, is following the rules and they're setting up in parks and they're getting permits and they're uh, being parts of very legal and, and healthy celebrations, um, mostly frequented by adults. And uh, they're called out in this policy um, and being required not to be 400 yards from schools, period. There's no time noted in this policy, right? There's, there's no day of the week. There's no um, addressing whether school's in or out. And so um, I'd like to vote for this policy. And here's my question um, to the attorney. Uh, can there be uh, a friendly amendment asking for this section either to be removed or to be addressed and brought back uh, so it is uh, appropriate and doesn't uh, be punitive to such businesses as the mofo people. You can always make a motion, seconded, approved by the board, to um, amend or rephrase this uh, particular section. I was not involved in the uh, any legal analysis of these provisions, including this one. So uh, 
I, I will ask for that, and I'm not trying to stall this because I will end up eventually voting for this, but I do think it's really important that when you put policy into effect that it is super clean. And there's also an issue of, well, if we're going to try and support this or clean it up in administrative regs, where does that leave the public who wants to follow what happens and make sure that that really does happen and that does you know keep things reasonable and not... Uh, enact something like this 400 yards it's not really clearly outlined you know how do they stay involved in the process so um, I am going to ask that but I, I um, just have one little question and it's actually not for you it's uh, for Mr. Ibarra and, and maybe jointly and this is about the honey sticks are the honey sticks uh, allowable for sale no I mean under this policy And he's saying they should be the alternative to the maple sugar packets. Well, yes. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, that's a, a lovely alternative. And uh, I think it would be wildly popular. Mm-hmm. Right. The only problem you'll have is how many honey sticks can you buy? <laughs> <laughs> and we are actually at the central kitchen meeting that we'll be having in a couple of weeks asking for feedback on items like being able to procure from local vendors. So the honey sticks could come up at that time. Okay. Um, so um, acting president, Ryan, I don't want to disrupt this process, but I think it is really important that... Um, this be looked at and cleaned up for our mofo industry here in Sacramento because it's problematic. And I'd rather have a clean policy. So I'd like to move. You can move approval with an amendment. If it's seconded in and approved by the board, then it's so amended. So it's up to uh, a motion can be made to approve with an amendment to this particular section, whatever you are proposing. If it's seconded, it can be further discussed. Um, if there's no second, then there's no pr a proposal to amend before the board. So it's up to the board to make the amendment. Board Member Cochran, would you be okay with us asking for questions from other board members while we try and look at that language and ascertain how we could massage it? Sure, that'd be fine. Uh, but I, I will just wrap up just finally that, you know, don't push forward a policy that's not clean. I mean, going into administrative rigs and still engaging the public is a very difficult task. And so uh, let's do it and do it right. If we really believe in this, um, happy to vote for it. Uh, I'm cringing a little because I know the realities of the classroom. But um, I think it's the right thing to do. But let's make sure that it's really written tight. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to hear from Board Member Minnick. Hi, thanks. Um, thank you for your very like clear presentation on this. I know you know this document is big, and there's a lot lot to it. Um, uh, I I do want to say that I'm I'm glad that my colleagues you know circled back around the vendor carts because. Um, I know that's an issue I see, you know, in front of West Campus, there's, you know, the, you know, the truck selling, you know, all kinds of, you know, uh, sugary stuff, snow cones and whatever. Um, but, but the, the gentleman from Sactomofo's comments struck me and, and um, I don't really know how far 400 yards are, to be honest, um, but it sounds pretty far. Um, and like he said, you know, a lot of our schools are near, you know, in urban areas where there's other things that are going on. And, um, and I really appreciate Member Cochran's um, point in wanting to, to wanting to clean that up. So we are really addressing the concern that we have and not a concern that we don't have, um, especially when there's a lot of probably, um, you know, food trucks in our community now that are, are also selling things that fit within our guidelines. Um, and so I'm glad that that was um, talked about. Um, and to um, 
it, and I was thinking about some of Mr. Um, Ibarra's uh, comments, and, I, and it struck me when, when Mr. Towers spoke um, that, you know, I see this as this living document, you know, where we're, we're setting the stage now that, you know, we really want our kids to be healthy and uh, we want to set this tone, um, but I don't see this being the final, the final draft by any means. It might be the final for right now, um, but I see that, um, you know, moving over, over time. I also appreciate that you referenced the, the, um, the schools that we have that are um, 7th through 12th grade, because um, I know we had talked about that, um, because, uh, you know, I specifically appreciate that you guys looked uh, differently at the high school, um, fund, you know, fundraising as being a factor. Um, I want to thank you guys for how much energy you've put into making sure that you took took that feedback to heart. I know, you know, from, you know, Kelsey and I out there at, at Member Nguyen's uh, uh, leadership class at 7 a.m. and and you spending time with with um, Member Nguyen and I to go through some of the questions we had, you know, I, I think, and I can see how much of that has been um, incorporated in this, that, that it's been brought back to the committee and we we're making sure that even though so much of it is um, rough uh, because it's, you know, out of our control, um, you know, I think that we've, we've made a really good effort to make it as palatable as possible. Um, I really do appreciate the gentleman in the front row, second of us, sorry, I forgot your name. Um, but um, when you talked about it being uncomfortable, you know, I really appreciate your kind of, you know, problem solver mindset in this. And like, you know, yeah, this is, might suck for some folks for a while and that's okay. And we should embrace that and use this as an opportunity to find ways to make this work. So, I, I appreciate that. So I appreciate the work, and, and I'm glad that we're able to kind of um, make, you know, some possible adjustments to some of the things that, um, w you know, like the vendor carts, which I don't even know how we would enforce that. Um, so um, so thanks. Thank you, Board Member Minnick. Our two final questions and comments are from uh, student board member Nguyen, followed by um, Vice President Wu. Um, to start off, I just want to say thank you so much for putting the time and effort into this proposal. It was a lot of work. And as a student, a main concern is fundraising. We have a lot of events. Um, as a personal, like, West Campus student, uh, ASB member, we have to pay for referees for, like, games, um, dances, and graduation. And these events are extremely, like, expensive. And it's up to us to fundraise. So I think further conversation on healthy but high school friendly um, fundraisers would be very much appreciated. But I also agree with the other board members that transparency between state and federal guidelines and um, recommendations that the committee has offered up uh, would be great for the public and also for us. But overall, my advisory vote would be to approve the plan. Thank you. Thank you, student member Nguyen. Board member Wu. Thank you, President Ryan. So I have two comments. Um, the first comment uh, involves um, food used for pedagogical purposes. Uh, we had an extensive discussion about that last time. I think that might be something that um, Mr. Perriman was uh, hinting at or suggesting that it might cause a rift, but I didn't see it in this draft plan. Did I miss it someplace? We, we added it. I, I'm not, is it in the board packet, the amended? Well, Nathaniel was looking for that. Then I, I wanted to address the um, um, outside vendor cards. And I'm going to, I hope in line with Member Cochran's thoughts, but what I'm going to suggest is um, I will make the motion to approve the, the wellness policy with the exception of the second bullet on page 11 regarding outside vendor carts. I think that uh, school districts have the responsibility for the health and safety of their children and the people who work with them and for them. Uh, and I think that we have um, overall responsibility over 
dictating time, place, and manner of certain commercial um, uh, uh, activities, but I kind of question how close around uh, the perimeter of the school our, our reach is. So having said that, I would like to, uh, for the time being, remove the second bullet and then bring it back to the committee for further study. Uh, and with that, then we'll have a, a, a much, hopefully, we'll, we can, the committee and um, staff can come back with a much more solid, um, uh, specified, definable um, a policy regarding outside vendors and trucks and carts that would be um, uh, more satisfactory. Uh, Vice President Wu, can I can I ask you? So we have uh, advice from legal counsel that essentially shares a couple important things. One, right now the current regulation is that uh, vendor carts, trucks, or vehicles are prohibited from locating within 200 yards from any school grounds and for up to 30 minutes after the school day. Um, but that is very difficult to enforce. And so what legal is saying is that if we were to keep bullet two outside vendor carts, trucks, or vehicles, are prohibited from locating within 400 yards from any school grounds, but add the qualifier at the beginning that unlicensed outside vendor carts were prohibited. That really puts the onerous of regulation and enforcement on the city, and it gets us to this issue of safety. Would that be an amendment that you would be comfortable with? I think that this gets to the heart of the issue that some of our other board members have expressed and that um, we heard from MOFO. And, and so the licensing authority would be the city of Sacramento? Correct. Is that who we'd be relying on? Correct. And then would you specify also um, um, that it could not occur uh, within or... Uh, through half an hour after the standard school day? We can absolutely do that. And, and our legal counsel has said, yes, then the enforcement authority would fall onto the city. Or the county. The county. Or the county. So I think that that would be um, the best possible compromise moving forward. So if we have agreement, we can take that friendly amendment. Um, and, and Board Member Vang? Okay. Wonderful. So do I have a motion? I'll make that motion with, with the, the distance regarding unlicensed um, uh, vendors and the time restriction regarding up on... And otherwise... School, not during school hours and not before half an hour after the school day ends. To adopt the full proposal with that friendly amendment, the addition of that language of unlicensed and the 30 minutes Correct. extension of the school day. Do I have a second? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those abstained? All those opposed? So the ayes carry. The eyes carry. We are passing a new school wellness policy. Thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you very much. Be before we move on, do we find where the um, pedagogical purposes are located? Yes, it's page 11 under requirements for out outside food sales in California public schools. Uh, there, I see it. Second see it? open bullet. There you go. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So at this time, we are moving on to our final items of the evening. And thank you so much to our school wellness community committee and all those who worked tirelessly on the student wellness policy. Item 10.3, Board Bylaw 9002, Constituent Service, presented by Nathaniel Browning who will be staying before us for a few board policies that we have before us this evening. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Nathaniel Browning, and I'm here on behalf of the board's governance and policy committee to present you with the newly proposed bylaw for a first reading and discussion. Board bylaw 9002 
constituent service will come back to the board for a full vote on September 7th for action. This presentation will focus on five areas related to the proposed bylaw and constituent services at large within the district. Those include the need to increase um, focus on services, best practices to draw from, the role of the governance and board in setting the direction, and the importance of the bylaw and next steps. This presentation also parallels the next presentation on tonight's agenda. Guiding the work of staff on this and other efforts in the district are the core values, equity, achievement, integrity, and accountability. And a saying that personally helps me bring those core values to life is, fair isn't everyone getting the same thing, fair is everyone getting what they need in order to be successful. Again, fair isn't everyone getting the same thing, fair is everyone getting what they need to be successful. The district's goals also guide this work with a specific focus on operational excellence. The reason this bylaw is coming forward to, as a first reading are multifaceted. First, the district is committed to serving our students, families, and community in order to provide the best possible educational experiences, customer service experiences, and opportunities available to them. Unfortunately, the community has expressed some frustration with our current level of community service throughout the district, both the district and site levels. Examples of that include um, possible unresponsiveness at front office, um, including also being shuffled around uh, from department to department on the phone here at the district office. This bylaw would help develop a coherent focus on constituent services within the district uh, and provide increased clarity around roles and services by specific staff. The intention is that no service would be duplicated or fall through the cracks. Doing such will also allow for staff to more re readily focus on instructional leadership and offer work and other work that will lead to greater student achievement. Transparency around constituent service and operational excellence will increase with quarterly reports to the superintendent and the board as outlined in the bylaw. Such reports will include trends and staff response times on constituent uh, concerns as well as information. This effort will lead to a focus on the continuous improvement and operational excellence of the district by providing the opportunity to analyze service and complaint trends on a number of levels throughout the district. This proposed bylaw requires uh, Request that the board and superintendent develop a system of constituent services that include a protocol for handling constituent requests, a primary contact person for whom will manage the constituent requests, a form and process for the primary person to document those requests, an information management system for storing, tracking, categorizing, and analyzing those requests, and a feedback process so that board members know the resolution, system oversight, by management, and as I previously mentioned, quarterly reports to the board and superintendent. There are two notable districts that look uh, that we've been looking towards in helping develop this understanding and uh, this bylaw. The closest one to us is obviously Natomas. They developed their constituent and customer services program in 2004 and by 2005, we were recognized statewide and received a golden bell for that. Oh, in 2014. Fresno USD also has a constituent services office um, and that was developed in the mid 2000s and likely served as the guiding light for Natomas. Um, staff, district staff have traveled to both locations and worked with those uh, departments um, to learn more. Multiple sources of research on school governance have illustrated that highly effective boards focus on these primary roles. 
setting the overall direction of the district through long term range planning, establish the structure of the school district through the adoption of policies and bylaws, hiring the superintendent to carry out the board's direction, and prov providing support to the superintendent and staff in a civil and courteous manner, and ensuring an accountability of public by deeply studying uh, student achievement and other trends throughout the district, and acting as a community leader. This bylaw is important because it clearly delineates between the board and staff roles in addressing constituent requests and concerns through a definition that highlights management's role in thinking, taking the responsibility of helping citizens receive services and the board's role in providing oversight and accountability to ensure the program is administered and functioning properly. Again, the bylaw outlines the requirements that shall be included in a constituent services system, as previously mentioned, with regular quarterly reports given to the board and superintendent. So the next steps include the adoption of the board bylaw 9002 and corresponding civility policy at the September 7th meeting, and for staff to develop a plan to implement a constituent service program in the coming months. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Browning. Before we take questions, do we have any public comments on this item? Yes, we do. We have, uh, if you could come up, Darlene Anderson, Sherilyn Dalton, and John Perryman. Good evening, Darlene Anderson. As a constituent, that means I'm a voter. And as a voter, we elect different board members for different areas. I used to live over there in Oak Park, but now I live in the South area. And I clearly understand that it's the voice of the public that oversees the public school system. I don't believe many understand to the level of what I understand. Because simply, there are too many African-American children falling through the cracks here. After 12 years of district service, they are out there on the street, and we have too high of prostitution and drugs and gang-related activities. And quite simply, if we could measure the benefit of public education, it wouldn't be like this. If we had some form of accountability, it wouldn't be like this. If parents understood and could be educated to the level of how they need to be supportive of their children. These are the same kids who didn't graduate from public school system, Sacramento, and this is 30 years later, and we are feeling the impact of a disengaged community, and this is what it feels like, and it really feels like this because when you look at African-American people who've only been in the public school system less than 50 years, well, what do they know about it? They don't know a whole lot, and they try to stay away because this district uses punishment. They use CPS, the district attorney, don't show up and see what happens. Even if you have to come, you don't have to be successful. So failure is an option. But what do you do when you have, I've been coming for more than 20 years and trying to share the problem. We have a new superintendent, yes. But when we talk about holding staff accountable for data, do we have anything that they're gonna produce to measure the benefit of public education? Are we going to ensure that those students are being successful, and then we have an open enrollment policy that has a revision date, but no board policy. And so I want to know just what's going on. I think if parents want to transfer schools, then there should be a board policy that is not inclusive of behavior. And I'll talk about that in the next, your next agenda item. It's called civility. Hey, darling. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sherilyn Dalton, and I can understand what Darlene's talking about the data. <clears throat> I think it's criminal how children are able to write data on other children and teachers. You, are, you have your credentials to do certain things. None of you or children should be writing data on these children, and then me as a parent, don't find out this data until years later or when I'm bamboozled into a SARBs meeting. That's when I find it out. I don't even get invited 
I got bamboozled there. And I'm, everybody's looking at it right now. But what Darlene's talking about, this data, you guys need to watch what you guys are letting these teachers and these children put data on our African-American children. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, this proposed board policy I'm in favor of um, it's a policy designed to limit undue influence. Though when I first read it, I thought, well, why are we bothering? In 25 years of watching the board, I've never even heard of a board member uh, using undue influence to enrich themselves, their family, or their business contacts. There have, however, been fairly regular cases of administrators doing so. And when they do so, sometimes for millions of dollars, they follow a pattern. They gain regulatory authority, they write new regulations, and then they become a consultant or a vendor, sometimes while they're in administration, and sometimes immediately after they resign their position. The board needs to establish rules to prevent both of these patterns. Um, there are cases, it's coincidence, not intent, last week in the beat. Is this? I don't know where it shows up. Um, official with Los Angeles Unified indicted from the bonus committee. Um, I think you need to have policies in place to prevent conflicts of interest, prevent consulting jobs on the side, even after the administrator leaves your employee and then goes to work for a vendor. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes public comment on this item. So we're going to go ahead and take board questions. I want to remind the board that we are running significantly behind. And so in order to get to our other items in a timely fashion, if we can keep our questions and comments brief. It looks like they're going to be very brief. Nobody has questions. So I am greatly appreciative of the work of uh, Mr. Browning and others in bringing this before us based upon best practices in Natomas and Fresno Unified. Clearly, we have had an astonishing lack of procedures and systems for addressing constituent concerns. And so this is an important foundational step in rectifying this. This is a first reading. And so with no questions, we're going to go ahead and move to item 10.4, Board Policy 1300, Civility. All right. So I worked all the kinks out of the first one, so this one will go very quick and smooth. Wonderful. Good evening again, Madam President, Board Members, Superintendent. I'm Nathaniel Browning. I'm here to present uh, the proposed brand new Board Policy 1300, Civility. It will come back before the board on September 7th for a second vote, a second reading and action. This pre presentation will focus on the same areas as the previous presentation, but with some slight differences. Of course, guiding the work are the district's core values and goals. The reason this policy is coming forward as a first reading is multifaceted. Those reasons are nearly identical to the same one that we just heard about, however, with one exception to the third bullet in bold. The, the civility policy outlines the manner and philosophy of which people throughout the district are treated and treat each other um, with a focus on service to others. That is why the civility policy is designed to accompany the constituent bylaw you just heard about. This policy will outline a shared understanding of civility, courtesy, and respect among the board, staff, and community members throughout the district, whether during a board meeting in the district office or in a hallway at a school site. You might think of it as the district's golden rule policy. The policy also outlines an acceptable, unacceptable behavior, such as behavior that disrupts school operations, the use of obscenities, or speaking in a loud, insulting, or demanding manner. This policy will be used as the cornerstone of the constituent services initiative that staff have been talking about by providing policy language that can be used as a reminder, guidelines to follow uh, when providing customer service to constituents, 
and as a platform for providing customer service training to staff. I spoke about two best practices previously, but I want to call specific attention to Fresno. Fresno utilizes professional learning and capacity building to support frontline office staff in making sure students, families, and community members feel welcomed, heard, and appreciated in their, in our facilities, in their facilities. This proposed policy contains language needed to provide staff with trainings to this end. Specifically, the policy calls for staff to establish regulations and procedures as necessary to provide a complaint process for alleged violations of this policy. Such procedures may include how best to train and support staff who receive a complaint against them for using disrespectful or a demeaning tone with a constituent. Fresno also uses board meetings as a platform for reminders of this policy by reading it aloud. So with that, the next steps are to have the board adopt this policy at the September 7th meeting and for staff to develop and implement a constituent services program in the coming months. Thank you, Mr. Browning. Do we have any public comments on this item? We do have two public comments, John Perryman and Darlene Anderson, followed by Sherry Dalton. Darlene Anderson. So we do have a hearing office and a lot of data has been collected there for years. They used to go in with cameras and record when they removed families, children from their families, and I think the district stopped that. But they still do make recommendations with CPS and, you know, behavior is an issue. Since behavior is an issue, we don't exactly teach students to transition to tasks. And so I do know of a kindergartner who was put on a min minimum day, who the principal locked him in the room and then recorded it, and then took him over to the SARB office, and then won a minimum day, and then we applied for a special ed, and we got some services for the boy. And then he went back on regular ed, and now he's doing better, but he's behind because he was being sent home every day. You see, behavior is human behavior. Transition is transition to task. But when people can collect data on you and win a minimum day, some people just never catch up. It's kind of really frustrating. I had a student myself who was autistic, and he had such behavioral problems. And we won services, but we had an outside consultant provide behavior analysis. And then we had taught him the task. He graduated with a high school diploma. So, you know, it can happen only if it, the services are working. I don't know how much information this board gets from the SARB office, and if you ever even look at the data on how many students have behavioral issues, but I do know that it's kind of out of control when you have students who write reports, and that goes on the, in the behavior record, and then you haven't been able to lower because you don't know what's going on. And it's really tragic when kids are being documented and that file follows them to court. And then your last person who was over, who's over now at the LCAP says, oh yeah, we send those records over to the courthouse. So if you never teach somebody something and you document them all their life and then they have this record, it's called a jacket. And these kids are wearing the jacket and it's school to prison pipeline. And that's what we need to stop. We need to know what's going on over there in the SARB office and we need to correct and give students services. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, uh, I'm generally in favor of this policy. I thought I might even have my students read it as a good discussion vehicle, but you need to fix some, some issues with it. Uh, and or is not a word. And the meanings are so divergent that depending upon which meaning you use, you end up with interpretive problems. Like an item D, if it's and, then all parts of the clause must be true for me to be in violation of the policy. Which means I could use obscenity, obscenities to insult and demean students as long, I did, as long as I did so in a quiet voice. If it's or, then you're prohibiting me from ever speaking in a loud voice. 
fix the grammar issues, please. Other than that, vote for it. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Hi, Sherilyn Dalton again. Um, there was a video in the bamboozled meeting that I had, that they had of my son. <clears throat> but the SARBs guy said they couldn't show me all of the video. And I want to know why. And I want to see a policy on it. If you can show me bits and pieces, you can show it all to me. Or don't show me none at all. Because it doesn't make sense to me as a parent. You got me here. Show it all to me. And then with these um, transfers and permits and things like that, I asked the board, please, can I have a copy of your uh, inner district school permits? That's all I, I need. That I didn't find it on your site. I got a date, and that's it. And I don't think that's fair to parents like me who want to dig in and work with you guys to better excel my child. And SARB is not the way to do it. He's only 11. Thank you, Mr. Browning. Yeah, may I ask, Ms. Dalton, would you please stay? I have one more presentation, and I would love to talk to you after my next presentation. Thank you. So, Mr. Browning, there was a suggestion made that we change in three sections and or to and. Are we comfortable doing that? Yes, there is a, a governance and policy committee meeting coming up next Friday before the next board meeting, so we can clear so that up. So this is just a first reading, so we can go ahead and talk about the grammatical issues at that meeting. So we have no board member questions. We're going to go ahead and move on to board bylaw 9005, governance standards. All right, just under the bell. Good evening again. Madam President, members of the board, superintendent, I'm Nathaniel Browning, and I have one last item as a first reading that will come back on September 7th. That's board bylaw 9005, governance standards. This presentation will focus on four areas related to this bylaw, and they include the government's team's previous and ongoing focus on effective governance, best practices, uh, illustrate the board's influence on improving student achievement and the importance of this bylaw in supporting the day-to-day -day decision making of district staff and next steps. Again, guiding this work is the district's core values and goals. The board has participated in four governance retreats over the last couple of years with a shared interest in continuing the focus on growing professional, ongoing professional development. Those retreats have helped the board to begin to understand the distinction between board member and superintendent roles, as well as how to better work as a team. The board has also begun to focus more specifically on how they can best influence student achievement through their governance lens. But I believe the board understands this is a transformative process that requires ongoing work and dedication to the improvement. Leading research on effective governance has repeatedly illustrated the ability for boards to improve student achievement, and much of that research points to the self-imposed structures, roles, norms, and focus of the board as key indicators of such success. Such roles, norms, and focus are outlined in this board bylaw. On this slide, I have a quote from Thomas Alsbury, a professor of educational leadership at Seattle University and author of Student Board Effectiveness. Um, he summarizes it best in one sentence. When the structures and norms of behavior within the school culture positively affect instructional practices, improved student achievement is expected and typical. This proposed bylaw is important because it illustrates the board's intention of keeping achievement for all students as the primary focus of this work. It also illustrates that the board is dedicated to the, 
to their role as the governing body of the district, follow norms of behavior and civility, keep confidential information confidential, and outlines the need for a periodic board self-evaluation. And next steps include the adoption of this policy at the or bylaw at the September 7th meeting. Questions? Thank you, Nathaniel. Do we have any public comment? No public comment. No public comment and no board questions. So um, this is the first reading. We'll be coming back to this item. Our final item of the evening, 10.6, monthly facilities update with Kathy Allen. Good evening, Vice President Hansen. Um, excuse, excuse me. Got part of that right, Ryan. Members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar. <laughs> um, tonight, we're going to talk about our monthly facilities update. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on um, the earlier presentation about the opening of schools because I've included some things in here that um, my four departments have uh, done in, also in preparation for the opening of schools. So again, a little bit of the highlights of the summer's work. These are the four departments that I have the pleasure of managing. Um, in planning and construction, the one I really want to call your attention to here would be the fire alarm upgrades. We just did our last four schools. Um, this has been a three-year long process to do every school in the district at a cost of about six and a half million dollars. This was not known to us when the bond was passed in, in November of 2012. But shortly thereafter, we received word from local fire authority that we had to upgrade or replace um, all of our fire alarm um, systems throughout the whole entire district, 90 plus sites. So that was a, a big chunk of change and um, a three-year process it's taken. Under planning and construction, you've heard me talk about uh, most of these before. Maybe some of the new ones here would be the Career Tech Ed incentive grant projects. We're working with the academic office on this. Um, our career tech ed department is going to receive upwards a little over $5 million to do some projects that we've brought to you um, a few times to talk about priorities and what it might look like. So we're really starting to um, dive into that project, those projects. So actually really looking forward to that, especially being able to work cross-departmental is going to be kind of exciting. Um, the central kitchen phase one, which is the relocation of the transportation department. Um, we are way ahead of schedule on that. Well, not way ahead, but we are ahead of a schedule on that and worked very hard over the summer with transportation folks to um, get the plans um, designed, the program designed, and we were just about there. We're out of um, schematics or out of design and into schematics. So this is our facilities um, maintenance and resource conservation department. We have eight shops there. Um, here's four of them. Um, I did want to call your attention to our plumbing shop where we repaired main irrigation lines at 16 sites. Part of the reasons our fields have looked so bad lately is in combination with the drought and the heavy use and everything else, um, not only just have we not had enough water to put on our fields and just overall um, landscaping as well, um, the drought when the, when the ground dries up like that breaks a lot of our irrigation lines. And so we constantly um, are out fixing old, old irrigation lines that have been buried underneath very hard packed uh, dirt for some time. Um, the carpentry shop, um, we actually bid out several roof replacements this summer, and it came in about double what we had estimated because, again, there's so much work on the street. Construction costs are way, way high. So our in-house guys did um, seven roofs, not, not whole entire roofs, but they did seven roofs over the summer, which is um, pretty cool for them. The battery backups district-wide in the electronics department is a huge, huge advance for us. So... Um, we're, we're not done, um, but we have started that program. This will help with our, our VoIP, our voice over IP protocol, and when the power goes out, we will still have phones for some time. Um, let's see. In our HVAC shop, um, you know, they're very busy over the summer doing um, their normal uh, maintenance for all of our systems. Um, one of the things I did want to point out here is, again, as we do every summer before school starts, We've gone around and fired up almost all of our HVAC and our um, system-wide boilers, make sure that things are running and are cool when the first day of school starts. Obviously, we're responding to problems as they come up. And as more people start coming back and moving into their classrooms, um, we'll probably get some more calls as well. Um, the ground shop, I wanted to again call your attention. We figured out that we mowed about 8,000 acres of lawn this, this uh, summer. Kind of large. 
The other two shops are electrical and, and painting. Um, the thing I want to point out here that you may not really hear that we do is uh, we did spend some time this summer to paint six kitchens. We do this in conjunction with Nutrition Services, obviously, and our local health department, which sometimes comes out and says, thou shalt paint your kitchens. <laughs> Project Green, uh, again, is one of our um, highly successful programs, um, one that we all enjoy working with because it's really one of our few opportunities that we get to work straight with kids. Uh, this is the program that you know the board's been involved with. It's funded out of our bond proceeds right now. Um, the kids put together uh, presentations to be heard by a panel of independent judges, and we get to award them funding for some of their projects. And uh, these are the basically the four main ones that we're working on this summer. So it's a super fun project, and we look forward to doing it every year. And October is our, is our green, green time this year. Prop 39, so this is the uh, Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, these are some of the larger programs that are projects that we are doing with this. We're replacing all of the HVAC at Washington Elementary. That was basically um, part two of uh, the opening of Washington. If you remember me talking about everything ceiling and down was phase one and ceiling and up was phase two. So they're getting um, all new HVAC units. I think those were the original to the school. So they were, they were pretty old and didn't have parts for those anymore. So. Um, that's going to be a huge, huge improvement for that site. Um, we also reached out to our charter schools because they were allocated Prop 39 funding as well, and we wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to access that funding. So we've um, worked with quite a few of them. Yapishu is one of them to do some heat pump replacements um, at nine classrooms. Um, we did complete more level two ASHRAE audits, and I could tell you what that stood for if I really thought about it. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a document that we have to have done uh, prior to accessing any money through the Prop 39 program um, through the um, Energy Commission. For nutrition services, these are really all um, wonderful stats for you in terms of you know, meals that we served over the summer. Um, one of the things I did want to um, call out is the new Yum Yummy app that we've done for our high school students, middle and high school students. It allows students to know the nutritional value of each of the items that we serve. Um, it also allows us to kind of track what the kids would be interested in and maybe format some more menu items um, along their liking. Um, we, <laughs> Diane, I don't know if Diane is still, she's not still here. So we purchased our first combi oven, um, which is kind of a cool thing if you're in nutrition services. It's something that we uh, would like to roll out all, at all of our sites, and this is also in preparation of our new central kitchen. We will be utilizing combi ovens at our school sites to um, deliver food and keep food at the right temperature. Um, back to school training for staff is coming up here in, in next week. Um, we're talking about um, leadership 101. We have diversity training, um, the stress club, take your power back, culinary knife skills, fish philosophy, which I have to figure out what that one is. Uh, the challenge of change and how to connect with your staff and how to handle difficult people. And then a, a general session on the recipe to serve. We have some professional consultants coming in to help us with that training as well. In transportation, um, this will be the first year since 2012-13 where the department will have enough drivers to assign bus routes for the opening of school. Um, you've probably heard us uh, talk a lot about, you know, we just can't get drivers, can't keep drivers. So we had six new trainees who completed um, behind the wheel training, and then two who have passed the training already. The job fair produced seven already licensed bus drivers, which is huge for us. I think four of them have gone through the, the mandatory um, fingerprinting, et cetera. So it was just like a kind of an aha moment. It was wonderful. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the weekly um, design team met with transportation involving all employees, all, all bargaining units, spent an awful lot of time looking at these documents and, and finally think that they've come up with something that's going to be great for our transportation facility. We did receive a grant last year to redo 14 compressed natural gas buses. Um, um, we had to put new tanks on them. It was about $238,000, which we pay for up front, and then we get reimbursed by the Air Quality Board, which is kind of exciting. After a thorough... Uh, Waxing and cleaning these buses will be placed on routes in an effort to be green and reduce our carbon footprint. And just because we, I have to in summer, I threw some pictures in here. So we'll, we'll come back <laughs> to the board a little bit later with a more in-depth presentation on some of the, the projects that we've done this summer. But this is McClatchy, um, some of the VAPA. The middle one there on the top is the Performing Arts Center. Um, 
looks like we're craning in something heavy, probably a SMUD transformer on the right. And then the field um, is actually looking nice and level, which is kind of cool. Um, and we have a tour of that site next Monday. And then this is Kit Carson. So um, the admin building has been open for some time. The, the one-story new construction addition there will be open in time for school to start. But we're cutting it really, really close on, on both of those projects, actually. It's been a, it's been a good summer. Um, a lot of work gets done. Um, just a couple things I wanted to highlight here. We processed over 465 civic permits in just two months' time. We completed over 25 work orders, 2,500 work orders in two months' time. And while they were doing all that, the, main, the maintenance department also managed to complete 124 projects. So those are in addition to the work orders that are on the books already. And we also collected over $623,000 in developer fees. Done. 15 seconds to spare. Right. Um, do we have any public comment? No public comment. Okay, and we have no board questions at this time. Thank you, uh, Ms. Allen, for the time you put into this presentation. So 11.0, business and financial information reports. We'll receive those business and financial reports. Item 12.0, future board meetings. Uh, we're going to have a special board retreat on August 20th from 10 to 4 p.m. at the California Medical Association. Uh, final item, 13.0, adjournment. Do we have a motion from our student so member? So moved. And do we have a second? second. All those in favor? Okay.